<clears throat> Greetings, everybody. This is Jesse here coming at you with another study. And um, today, in, or in this study, we're, I'm going to be concentrating mainly on what is called the Church Fathers. And <clears throat> I'm sure we have all heard this before. You know, guys like Augustine, as you see here on the screen, um, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, um, John Chrysostom, all of these names, okay? And um, what's really unique about this is both Protestant and Catholics alike both hold these fathers as in high reverence. Um, but the thing is, is, and it's very amazing that they hold these fathers up to such a high reverence, even though individuals that might disagree with this might say, well, no, we don't hold them above the apostles in the Bible. But how many times when you go and watch debates and when you go and watch presentations or radio shows you know these christian these christians out here will always make an emphasis on the church fathers well what did the fathers believe what did the fathers you know the fathers this the fathers that and i want to set the record straight here that this is not a condemnation of any of these men i don't know their hearts but what we're going to look at is their history, okay? And one thing I do want to make clear is that the majority of these fathers that are held in a high regard, really in a sense, are from the post-persecution era, okay? And the post-persecution era um, started off with Emperor Constantine. And you have many a people that will go and expose Constantine, but what they will not, or what they don't want to admit, or maybe they're just ignorant of the fact that many of these fathers were bishops under Emperor Constantine. They had the support of the emperor. Okay. So what's, so where do we go wrong? And it's really my strongest conviction, you know, because you hear about this, you might hear this maybe in your own home and these types of things that you have everybody teaching different kinds of doctrines and they all believe that they're right. And there is just so much confusion. Okay. Well, the Bible states that God is not the author of confusion. And I would like to be so bold to state that really a lot of the confusion that crept into the church has its grassroots in the first five centuries specifically <clears throat> the years um, following the death of the last apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay? And even this confusion was even starting to creep in in their day. Okay? And so this is what I want to try to concentrate on. Okay? And we're going to be doing a more in-depth reading of a research paper or article on Augustine. And so this, I mean, it's not mine. You know, I'm going to be quoting, um, and, and uh, the, the, there are sources quoted within this research, so again, don't get mad at me, because if you want to get mad at anybody, get mad at the people I quote, okay? I'm just laying it out there, and you decide. Do your own research, okay? Um, but if we go to... This is out of New World Encyclopedia. Research begins here. Well, they're, they're very prideful in advertising their site, aren't they? 
Well, anyways, under the title of Church Fathers, I just want to read a couple of paragraphs from this. Obviously, you have the Apostolic Fathers, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch. All of these people, you know, that are called fathers, you will never hear any of the original disciples or... Um, apostles, you know, that are the authors of the New Testament. You'll you'll never hear their names, but you'll always hear the names of these individuals. Okay. And um I also want to take you back to this picture here. Isn't it funny that a lot of these church fathers was very unique. All these pictures of Augustine. You have a sun disc halo. Oh, there's the Dagon. There's the mitre cap. There's the Dagon cap again. There it is again. You know, I mean, over and over and over again. I mean, these are men that even Protestants hold to to such a high regard, even as a as high of a regard as the Catholic Church does. I mean, you can see it over and over again. There it is again. There's the Dagon cap, um, the mitre, and I mean. I mean, you see this all over, all over the place. These are all pictures and paintings of constant of uh, Augustine. Okay, there it is again. Another one, another one. So, I mean, <clears throat> the point is, is I think we need to back away from these church fathers and get back to the simple truths of the Bible and the Bible alone. But anyways, let's go back to this uh, couple of paragraphs here. Here we see a picture here. And these are the church fathers and others that are gathered with Emperor Constantine I at the First Council of Nicaea. And here are all the church fathers, and there's the emperor. You know, so, again, this is post-persecution. This is when Christian persecution suddenly stopped. And as strange as this seems, even that is unbiblical. We're going to get to that in a moment. So, let's go ahead and read this, Church Fathers. The Church Fathers, or Fathers of the Church, mind you, none of the disciples or the apostles are considered Fathers of the Church. It's always these men. Are the early and influential theologians and writers in the Christian Church, particularly those of the first five centuries. The term is used for the intellectual leaders of the church, not necessarily saints, and does not include the New Testament authors. That's very much true. That right there should give us a suspicion, a red flag. Okay, now again, as I've stated before, it doesn't mean that we can't glean off of some of their writings because some of their writings are based on scripture, you know, on, on scripture. But there's also the point of the fact of chicken and bones. You got to you got to spit out the bones and chew on the meat, folks. Okay, just because they say truth here and there doesn't mean that they were of God. Um, and that doesn't mean that they were to be revered. Um, it also excludes writers condemned as heretics, although several of the church fathers, such as Tertullian and Origen, did occasionally express heterodox views. Catholic and Orthodox traditions regarding the fathers of the church differ, with greater honor paid in the West to such men as Pope Gregory the Great and St. Augustine and more attention given in the East to such writers as Basile the Great and John Chrysostom. In addition, Orthodox tradition considers the age of the Church Fathers to be open-ended, continuing up to the present day, while Catholic tradition ends the age much earlier. Now pay attention to this. Protestant thought emphasizes the principle of Scripture only. Sola Scriptura, right? That was the watchword of the Reformation as a basis for Christian doctrine. 
but in fact relied heavily on the tradition of the church fathers in the early stages of the Reformation. Later Protestant thought, which I think is the better Protestant thought, has challenged this by seeking to make a distinction between the tradition of the church fathers and the teachings of earliest Christian communities led by Jesus and the apostles. The original fathers of the church, not these men. Some have pointed out that the heart of the problem of the tradition of the church fathers is its authoritarian doctrine of hierarchical church. Okay, so <clears throat> for those that like to say, oh, well, the Catholic Church didn't come into existence till after Constantine, well, well, folks, this whole aspect of the hierarchical church structure, which is the same as the Catholic Church structure, was going on even in the first century. Okay, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. Even so, one can find that the Church Fathers created a monument to God-centered thinking during the first several centuries, and that their thought is often truly inspiring and worthy of serious study. <clears throat> so, and I have no problem with that. You know, it's just like the same thing with commentaries today. There are some things you can pick up from commentaries. Okay, but we are not to hold these individuals above Scripture. We are not to hold these individuals as the sole interpreters of Scripture. Okay, we need to rely on the Scripture for the interpretation of Scripture. Okay, so I wanted to direct your attention to... <clears throat> this individual's webpage, endtimesprophecy.org. And I'm not going to read the whole article, but I'm going to read at least about half of it. And uh, and there's some very interesting things that are pointed out in here that I wanted to uh, direct your attention to. Now, here are these so-called church fathers, and that's what I like to make the emphasis on so-called church fathers. Here you see three pictures of them there with their nice little sun discs around their heads. Um, you know, and the thing is, is when you look at these, I mean, when you look at these men, and you look at the paintings of, their, of these men, where is the humility? Where is... Where is the example of persecution? Where is the modesty? I mean, all I see is the same thing as we have today. We have these preachers and these mainstream churches with $1,000 suits. And then you can even go to the other side of the spectrum and you look at Rome with all of their holier-than-thou robes, priestly robes and garments, they're fish miters, and again, there is no humility in all of these paintings of these men, of these so-called church fathers. And so that strikes me as kind of odd. Now, <clears throat> here's what this individual has to say on the topic mention church fathers today and instead of people thinking of Jesus's apostles or even God's Old Testament leaders and prophets a lot of people point to the Roman Catholic fathers do a search on the internet and instead of seeing the great names from the Bible you will see names like Oregon Clement of Rome Ignatius and Augustine but there is a big difference between the true church fathers, the apostles of Jesus Christ, and the later so-called fathers as named above. That's right. The true church fathers are the apostles of Jesus Christ. Okay. Not, not the so-called fathers that came after. <clears throat> 
and again, it's just quite, it, it's quite funny. And this should be enough to raise red flags that how come none of these men, Paul, Peter, John, are mentioned as church fathers, but you have all of these others, and which only really two of them can be named, can be found by name in the Bible. We're going to get into that in a moment. The apostles of Christ and writers of the New Testament taught a simple gospel that is clearly revealed to all who will believe. But the so-called church fathers that many people look to today replaced the simplicity of the gospel message with a mysterious and hidden message that could only be interpreted by themselves and the leaders of the visible church. In other words, confusion. The gospel is, is surrounded with simplicity. It is not surrounded with confusion. Okay, Much of the thought process that we have today stems from confusion. This is why we have so many Holy Spirits out there. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Oh, the Holy Spirit said this to me. The Holy Spirit revealed this. And yet... Everything that is talked about, that is, you know, that the people have dreams of, that God revealed something, it's it's confusion, and you see it all over the place. You you, you got to be un living under a rock to not see this. Okay. Whereas the scripture, the Bible, is supposed to be simple. The simplicity of the gospel message. But this has been trumped over by mysterious and hidden messages that can only be interpreted by themselves, the fathers, and the leaders of the visible church. Many eminent theologians of Christian history speak against accepting the writings of the so-called apostolic fathers with any authority. To get an example of the kind of spirit that was driving these so-called church fathers, you only need to look at Augustine, and he is the crim to the crop, okay? Once while addressing some non-Catholic monks from North Wales who would not bow to his and the Roman church's request, he shouted, quote, and this is from Augustine, If you will not join with us in unity, you shall from enemies suffer the vengeance of death, unquote. Killing the Old Catholic Church, page 276 and 7. Doesn't that sound like, doesn't that echo hints of this whole thing with the ecumenical movement today? Wasn't this blending of the church and the state together under Emperor Constantine, this ending of the persecution, wasn't that in a sense a form of ecumenism that was going on even in the 4th century? There ain't nothing new under the sun. And so there has always been a dividing factor of those that wanted to remain separate and those that wanted worldly pomp. Here's another quote. A phenomenon singular in its kind is the striking difference between the writings of the apostles and the writings of the apostolic fathers. The writings of the so-called apostolic fathers have unhappily, for the most part, come down to us in a condition very little worthy of confidence, which aimed to crush the free spirit of the gospel. Neander, General History of the Christian Religion and Church, Volume 1, page 657. Here's another one. Quote, to the common people, the principal truths of Christianity were explained in their purity and simplicity and all subtleties were avoided, nor were weak and tender minds overloaded with a multitude of precepts. But in their schools and in their books, the doctors who cultivated literature and philosophy, and especially those of Egypt, deemed it elegant and exquisite to subject divine wisdom to the scrutiny of reason, or rather to bring under the precepts of their philosophy and to examine metaphysically the nature of the doctrines taught by Christ. At the head of this class was 
class of divines was Origen. He maintained that under the things there expressed, there was contained a hidden and concealed sense, which was much to be preferred to their to the literal meaning. And this hidden sense it is that he searches after in his commentaries, ingeniously indeed, but perversely and generally to the entire neglect and contempt to the literal meaning. Innumerable expositors in this and the following centuries pursued the method of origin, unquote. This is Moshim, Institutes of, of Ecclesiastical History, Book 1, Century 3, Part 2, Chapter 3. We look at another quote here. If we turn to the fathers with the hope that now at last we shall enter the region of unimpeachable methods and certain applications, we shall be disappointed. I would earnestly ask not to be misunderstood. There are but few of them whose pages are not rife with errors. Errors of method, errors of fact, errors of history, of grammar, and even of doctrine. The earliest fathers and apologists add little or nothing to our understanding of Scripture. We turn to them in vain for the justification of any claim to the possession of an infallible tradition. Unquote. This is Farrar, History of Interpretation, pages 162 to 165. Quote, when God's word is by the fathers expounded, construed and glossed, then, in my judgment, it is even as when one strains milk through a coal sack, which must needs spoil and make the milk black. God's word of itself is pure, clean, bright, and clear, but through the doctrines, books, and writings of the fathers, it is darkened, falsified, and spoiled. This is Martin Luther. Table Talk, page 228. Now, if you look at earlier commentaries on the Fathers, Martin Luther held them in a high standard, high regard. But later on in his life, he started to realize certain things. Okay? And uh, this is one of the things he started to realize. Adam Clark, on his commentary on Proverbs 8, states, quote, As to the fathers in general, of these we may safely state that there is not a truth in the most orthodox creed that cannot be proved by their authority, nor a heresy that has disgraced the Roman Church that may not challenge them as its abettors. In points of doctrine, their authority is, with me, nothing. The word of God alone contains my creed. Let me repeat that. In points of doctrine, there, the church father's authority is with me, nothing. The word of God alone contains my creed. Do we have this mindset today? Do yourself a little bit of soul searching, self searching for a moment. And really look and ask yourself, how often do you go to these church fathers for proofs of doctrine, proofs of, dare I say it, Sunday sacredness, um, proofs of the Trinity, and the church fathers were very, very much responsible for the bringing in of the Trinity, mind you, which has always been a pagan concept. And we're going to go into some confusion regarding the Trinity. We're going to see how the confusion really took shape and what we have today. And how so many years ago this has been brought into the church. And so you have to ask yourself, this is thousands, thousands hundreds of thousands of years that certain doctrines had time to engulf the minds of men. And so this is why, this is why a lot of us today 
have a hard time when we have individuals that are stating emphatically to lay preconceived notions aside. Because you got to think about this. A lot of this, conf a lot of these, the, the, this confusion of doctrines, these traditions, are brought to us from these first few centuries after Christ. And and so that's why it seems like there is so very few of us <clears throat> out there trying to explain these things. <clears throat> it was Satan's desire to replace the clear, divinely inspired writings of the prophets of God and apostles of Christ with writings of men whom confused the clear gospel truth and replaced them with mysteries that only the church leaders could interpret. This enabled Satan to lock the people up in a perpetual deception, causing them to look to church tradition over the word of God itself. And the author of this article states, and I have personally had this experience myself. And you need, and, and, and for those that may attend a congregation, and if you have certain questions you want to bring up to your pastors or whatever, maybe you can use this as a little experiment. And I have personally had this experience myself, talking to pastors of so-called evangelical churches. After showing them truths from God's word, they would tell me, quote, okay, I will go and check my books, books of the church fathers, to see what they say and get back to you. See what I mean? These, these pastors always have to go and rely on what these church fathers, quote unquote, supposed church fathers had to say in regarding to scripture interpretation and these are pastors of non Roman Catholic churches what does that say for today's churches anyway so now we come to the scriptural portion of our study before we get into um, <clears throat> some interesting history with Augustine and I title this church father mentality or simple Bible truth okay and let's just we really got to think historically here and this is what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12 yea and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, not might, shall suffer persecution. When, Const when Constantine had this vision of this cross in the heavens, and it stated, by this sign conquer, and this was his conversion story. And after his conquering, you know, and and so all of a sudden, <clears throat> Rome had officially become, the Christian religion had officially become the state religion of Rome under Constantine. And you have to be living under a rock to not know that Constantine incorporated many of his pagan traditions into the church in order to satisfy the pagans because had that not happened I think persecution would have still continued but by incorporating the paganism into Christianity well then that was a compromise 
And so hence, with this compromise, all of a sudden, persecution seemed to be done away with. And so all of these church fathers who aren't suffering persecution anymore, you have to go back to 2 Timothy 3.12 and then ask yourself, are they living godly in Christ Jesus? Because they're not suffering persecution anymore. Whereas the true saints of God who are still living during that time when persecution ceased are still suffering persecution. In fact, it is a lot of these fathers that supported the persecution of those that decided to remain separate from this hierarchy structure of now the new so-called Catholic Universal Church. And how early was this being manifested? Well, let's take a look at Acts chapter 20. This, I mean, some of this stuff really riles me up. It's like the whole notion of this, uh, the pre-trib rapture. Some of these things really um, get me riled up, gets me heated. Because here we have certain men being suffering, being butchered throughout history and yet here we have this fluffy doctrine of a pre-trib rapture in America saying oh <clears throat> you ain't gotta suffer persecution you ain't gotta worry about suffering persecution because you're, you're gonna be whipped out of here and you ain't gotta worry about that what about all your brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering where's their rapture this is another example Okay, Second Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution not might, shall Acts 20.29-31 20, For I know this that after my departing after my departing this is Paul speaking shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock also of your own selves shall men arise Speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And folks, I want to emphasize this strongly right here. Also of our own selves, of your own selves, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. I think that is a strong indication of a lot of these so-called church fathers, in fact, probably the majority. Could be thrown into this midst of men. And so this was going on even in the first century. Now, here is where one of these fathers are mentioned in the Bible. I beseech Euodias, this is Philippians 4, 2, and 3, and beseech Sintich Sin, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Now, a lot of people will just say, okay, that's Clement of Rome. He's mentioned in the Bible, right? Well, not so fast, because this is what tradition tells us, that this is that same Clement of Rome. So you can't just come to the conclusion because tradition says so. We all know what the Bible says about tradition. <laughs> In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the traditions of men, commandments of men, traditions, same thing. Well, the Thayer definition of Clement means mild and merciful. He is a companion of Paul and apparently a member of the Church of Philippi. According to tradition, though, he is identical with that Clement 
who was Bishop of Rome, or the Pope, towards the close of the first century. You know, and church tradition always likes to throw these people as, well, this was the second Pope, and this was the third Pope. Okay, just like they like to use the Apostle Peter as the first Pope. Simon Peter. Well, if you really dig deep enough, you'll come to find out that it's not Simon Peter, but it's another Simon, and his name is Simon Magus. That, chances are, more assuredly, is the first Pope. Let's take a look at Adam, what Adam Clark had to say regarding Clement. With Clement also, supposed keyword supposed, to be the same who was afterwards Bishop of Rome, and who wrote an epistle to the Corinthians, which is still extant. John Gill writes regarding this, with Clement also, which some think is the same with Clemens Romanus, who was afterwards Bishop of Rome, some think this, and whose epistle to the Corinthians is still extant. Other writings are ascribed to him, but are spurious, however. By his name he seems to be a Roman, and from his being joined with the apostles, as one with whom these women also labored in the gospel, he appears to be a preacher of it at Philippi. And another name comes to mind that is somewhat mentioned, but you want to know what's really unique is that this Clement of Rome, you can find writings of his all over the place, but Linus? I wonder why you just cannot f find any of his work, any of his writings. Seems kind of suspicious. But anyways, in 2 Timothy 4.21 it states, Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Linus means a net, and he was a Christian at Rome, known to Paul and to Timothy. Now Thayer just goes on and states who was the first bishop of Rome after the apostles, A.D. 64. Okay, well, maybe that's according to tradition, or maybe that's another supposed. Because surely there would have been writings of Linus if he was the first pope after the apostles in AD 64 but it seems like there's no writings of his whatsoever but Adam Clark states Pudens who is another name that is not really mentioned that much Pudens of this person we have again traditions and legends but nothing certain the Catholics make him Bishop of Rome Linus, he also is made by the same persons, the same Catholics, Bishop of Rome. But there is no sufficient ground for these pretensions. I wonder why Paul was never named Bishop of Rome. Interesting. <clears throat> I mean, everybody needs to be a pope. Folks, and for those that like to lay claim, oh, well, the papacy didn't exist until like the 6th century and these types of things, um, you have to understand something, that there's something called the mystery of iniquity. And there was already bishops of Rome during Paul's time. There were already popes being crowned during Paul's time. Just because this papacy did not rise into temporal power till the middle of the 6th century doesn't mean they weren't already at work in the ecclesial mindset the church mindset the religion aspect that's why Paul states 2 Thessalonians 2 7 for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Okay. And what did Paul say in Acts chapter 20? Let's go back up for a second. And let's read it again. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. 
Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. And with many tears, Paul ceased not to warn everyone in the church. This was a great burden to him. Where is that burden today? Oh, well, the church fathers said this about this passage. <sighs> and please spare me the whole excuse. Oh, well, Polycarp was a disciple of John. What did Acts chapter 20 just say? You know, Justin Martyr was a disciple of this guy. Does it really matter if they were discipled of the Apostle John or not? First John 2.18 states, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now, even now, in John's day, and in Paul's day, are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Pay attention to this passage. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out. Could they have went out to bring about their own traditions? Getting involved in studies of philosophy and Gnosticism and these types of things. Oh, it's very possible. Could this also have included Polycarp? What about Justin Martyr, John Chrysostom? What about all these people? Do we just say, oh no, no. Well, it's very possible because John does say they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us they would no doubt have continued with us but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us so again just because you have certain fathers they met that may have been direct disciples and students under John does not mean that they had good intentions throughout their whole lives. Now again, I am not judging these men. I am just simply stating that just because that certain individuals are discipled by the apostles themselves doesn't mean that their hearts were always pure from the very beginning. And by the way, those that went out from us are also labeled as the many antichrists. I just wanted to throw that one in there as well. Because there are many antichrists. And what are antichrists? Those that come in the name of Christ. Those that will proclaim Christ. But guess what? Guess what else they will proclaim? Tradition. Confusion. So I just want to make this make that emphasis very clear before we get into this article by Chuck Fisher which was used by permission called the sins of Augustine okay and this is where we're gonna spend the remainder of our time <sighs> now Augustine Aurelius Bishop of Hippo arguably is considered the most influential theologian after st. Paul as a pastor and bishop in North Africa, Augustine was one of the most prolific church writers. Maybe that's what we should call them. So let's stop calling them fathers. I mean, the, Jesus said, call no man your father, except he that is in heaven. You can call them church writers if you like. But I think we should etch that word fathers out of our vocabulary. In fact, if you want to look at the founding fathers of the church, let us, let's, let us look at Paul, Peter. James, John, 
Let's not look at Augustine or John Chrysostom, Polycarp, Justin Martyr. They weren't the fathers of the church. As a pastor and bishop in North Africa, Augustine was one of the most prolific church writers, dealing with the many theological issues that faced the church in his day. As a teacher, he influenced the course of the church, so he was a strong influence. And as a bishop, get this, he influenced the politics of Rome. Without a doubt, Augustine, it is considered a great man, but does he deserve this reputation? Well, let's look at the facts. The history of Augustine's life is pretty straightforward and well known. Son of a pagan father and Christian mother. Now, I mean, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that he, you know, was a bad guy. You know, it's just, I mean, this was their, this was his parents' mindset. A pagan father and a Christian mother. Now, they were unequally yoked, okay? Augustine grew up knowing the truth of the gospel, but led his own life. His father taking delight in his son's sexual escapades. Augustine became a well-known orator and studied the pagan philosophies of Plato. He's a Greek philosopher. By the way, if you look at Revelation 13, what does it say about the beast out of the sea? What is the body of that beast? Isn't it the body of a leopard? And what was the third beast in Daniel 7? Wasn't it a leopard? And isn't that leopard represented by Greece? So you have Grecian philosophy intermingled within Papal Rome, perhaps? Plato was a Greek philosopher. Anyways, let's continue. Augustine became a Christian at age 32. After discussions about Christianity with a friend and hearing a child's voice telling him to pick up a scroll and read it, this conversion story is one of the most famous in Christendom. After being baptized in 387, Augustine moved back to his hometown of Tagaste in North Africa to found a monastic community and become a monk. In 391, the church at nearby Hippo pressed him to become a priest. And five years later, he was made Bishop of Hippo. As a church leader, he became an active pastor, not only for his congregation and diocese, but for his faith. His life is best known for his doctrinal fights against Donatists and the followers of Pelagius. Now, a lot of people would label the Donatists as some heretical cult. But the funny thing is, is that these Donatists were one of these um, separated Christian sects that were still undergoing persecution in the post-persecution era under Constantine. Why yet the majority of Christendom has now become a intermingling of church and state. Perverter of the church? Well, Augustine has been called the great teacher of the church. What about Jesus Christ? And the doctor of grace? Again, what about our physician Jesus Christ? because of his influence on the doctrines of the church. Again, what about the influence of Jesus Christ? His voice was so powerful that a simple Augustine Dixit, quote-unquote, Augustine says, settled all arguments. Because Augustine said so. This is what settles all arguments, as to the teachings of Augustine. Augustine is still beloved is still a beloved theologian of theologians, studied in seminaries and schools of philosophy around the world. Seminaries and schools of philosophy. Hmm. However, there are a few things that those who sing Augustine's praises neglect to tell us, things which, if widely known, would call into question his 
supposedly great contributions to philosophy and theology. First of all, believe it or not, Augustine couldn't read Greek. It is not required in ministers that they be able to read Greek. Many, many ministers have been to Bible schools that have not required them to learn Greek. This does not mean that they're not qualified to pastor churches to preach and teach the gospel. However, for a theologian to not be able to consult the original languages of the Word of God, this is a critical fail failure. Now, now, this is the aspect of the theologian. Okay, We're not talking about the, the simple the simple common man okay theologians are are more of your intellectual gone to school got educated and these types of things that would be your theologian all right one of a high intellectual mindset This means that Augustine was not able to understand what Paul or Peter or John wrote. Let me repeat that. This means that Augustine was not able to understand what Paul or Peter or John wrote without relying on the say-so of a translator. Doesn't that sound vaguely familiar to when the Bible was heavily suppressed and what I would call the Dark Ages? I don't really consider the whole architectural aspect as the dark ages ages what i consider the dark ages is when the light of the gospel was dim and dark that's what i call the dark ages and so what happened well all of these laymen had to rely on the priest for the translation of the bible the same thing that augustine who did not understand what Paul or Peter or John wrote, had to rely on the say-so of a translator. Which Augustine did. Augustine relied on the translation of his close ally, Jerome of Palestine, which, by the way, is responsible for the Latin Vulgate, which is the primary text within the Roman Catholic Church. Jerome was the man who translated the Bible from the Hebrew and Greek into Latin. Unfortunately, Jerome was an extremely biased, didactic theologian, and in at least one theological area, that of justification, made an unfortunate translation that has affected the church ever since. Augustine took a word from Jerome's Latin Vulgate and gave us a Roman court model for justification, rather than the model that Paul presented in the original Greek that of a king declaring a subject in right standing with his or her king. Robert Brow, in his article, quote, Did Paul Teach Law Court Justification, wrote, quote, The words in the original Greek might allow, but they never require a judicial interpretation. Since the time of Chrysostom, it has been pointed out in the Greek church that Dikaio, could equally well be translated make upright or righteous if this greek orthodox reading of the epistle is correct then it would seem that it was the legal minds of the first latin translators and jerome's vulgate which introduced the forensic virus into the western church augustine did not know greek and he set the roman law court model in stone anselm and calvin clarify that logic with ruthless perfection A second problem with Augustine is where he got much of his theology from. Before becoming a Christian, Augustine studied two different religions, philosophies, that he allowed to influence him and brought their doctrines with him into the church. For nine years, Augustine was a Manichaean, a devotee of the teachings of Mani, founder of a Persian moral cult. Like the Gnostics of the first century, Mani and his followers were dualistic, teaching that the flesh was sinful and impure, while the spirit was light and life. 
as a Manichaean, this teaching was a comfort to Augustine, as it let him blame his continued sexual sin on his lower fleshy nature, but still be moral by emphasizing the separateness of flesh and spirit. This almost sounds vaguely familiar to your fundamental Baptist preachings of all you got to do is just believe. There's no repentance required. That would be work. Repentance is very strong. And as a matter of fact, I believe that it is our responsibility, that we have a responsibility to our God in regards to obedience. But Augustine, because of these teachings of this Mani and this Persian moral cult, this was a comfort to him because he could keep his continued sin on his lower fleshy nature, but still exercise his morality by emphasizing the separate the, the separateness of flesh and spirit while he still held on to some of his wrongdoings. This is where the concept of original sin comes from. Augustine's years with the Manichaeans left its impact on the church as he brought this teaching into the church through his teaching on original sin. A.T. Overstreet, in his online book, Are Men Born Sinners? The Myth of Original Sin, notes, Augustine's nine years with them, the Manichaeans, accustomed him to regard human nature as essentially evil and human freedom as a delusion. You know, Jesus Christ took on himself a human nature, and aren't we supposed to follow after his example? Did he not leave, live a sinless life, and yet he was still in a sinful human nature of a body, wasn't he? As a matter of fact, all you have to do is look at the temptations of Christ... He could have chose to command the stones to be made bread because he was he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He could have chose to accept Satan's offer and to give him all the kingdoms of this world if he would just fall down and worship him. But guess what? He chose not to. And if Christ is supposed to be our example... And even when you look at the 144,000, in their mouths were found no guile. So if the 144,000 can conquer this human sin nature, don't you think it's possible for us to conquer this human sin nature under Christ? It may seem impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Augustine next fell under the influence of Neoplatonism, and his theological views were strongly influenced by this philosophy as well. However, his doctrine of sin shows the obvious influence of the Gnostic teachings of Manichaeism, in which he assumes the most ridiculous teaching of all the heathen philosophies, the teaching that matter can be sinful. And this is the source of his doctrine that sin can be passed on physically from one person to another. He, um, and this gets pretty bizarre. Let's go ahead and continue. Harnack says, we have, finally, in Augustine's doctrine of sin, a strong Manichaean and Gnostic element, for Augustine never wholly surmounted Manichaeism. 
He just, it's just, I mean, it had Gnostic and Manichaean elements to it. And Augustine's doctrine of sin, with, with his belief in the inherent sinfulness of the physical constitution, is wholly Manichaean. His idea that sin is propagated through the marriage union, that sexual desire is sin, and that sexual lust and procreation transmits sin, is also Manichaean. Augustine built his doctrine of original sin upon this premise that sexual lust and procreation transmits sin. This is why this whole doctrine of infant baptism came creeping into the church, because, hey, if if mommy and daddy are in the midst of the act of procreating, okay, trying to have a baby, and since they're sinners, well, all of a sudden now, since the seed is being developed in the womb, and that sin is transferred onto the baby, and when that baby is born, it is already sinful. Meaning that it had already committed sin because of the transmission of sin from parent to child. And so that is why the necessity for infant baptism. Even though the baby has no idea what repentance means, has no idea what wrong and right is. As mentioned in the quote above, Augustine studied the teachings of pagan Greek philosophers, the Neoplatonists. In fact, Augustine was converted to Christianity through Neo, Platonists, Plato, philosophy. World Book Encyclopedia had these two comments to make about the influence of pagan philosophy on Augustine. Quote, the writings of the Neoplatonists and sermons of St. Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, convinced Augustine to accept Christianity. The writings of the Neoplatonists and sermons of St. Ambrose. You see the intermingling of pagan philosophy and Christian philosophy coming together. And so what, you know, so let's kind of look at, at it as a mathematical equation. Neoplatonism, pagan philosophy, plus Christianity equals tradition. And, continuing on, Augustine's study of Neoplatonism convinced him that God existed in the soul of every human being. The following is from the Concise Columbia Encyclopedia article on Neoplatonism. Quote, Neoplatonism, ancient mystical philosophy based on the later doctrines of Plato, especially those in the Timaeus, Neoplatonism, widespread until the 7th century, was an influence on early Christian thinkers, for example, Origen, and medieval Jewish and Arab philosophers. It was firmly joined with Christianity by Augustine, who was a Neoplatonist before his conversion, but he simply did not disregard his Neoplatonist beliefs. Did you get that last line? Augustine brought the pagan philosophies learned before his conversion into the church and much of our doctrine today is based on this. So let's look at the aspect of Constantine now. How do you think that Constantine was able to gather up these men? And how do you think Constantine was able to use these men to bring in all religions into the fold and call it Christian? Could it have been through the philosophies of these pagan individuals? I think so. And blending the two, Greek philosophy with Christian 
theology. What is generally not known about Augustine is that he favored his philosophers more than the Old Testament revelation. Bishop Ambrose, who was instrumental in converting Augustine, had to help him overcome his problem with the Old Testament. It seems that Augustine felt that the God of the Old Testament was capricious and vindictive, and at odds with the God of the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that what we see today in amidst all of the atheists out there? How could a God be so cruel? A vindictive evil monster that murdered, pillaged, brought people into slavery and these types of things. Just such an evil and vindictive God. <laughs> well, you can trace all of that back to a supposed Christian, which is Augustine. So how did Ambrose and Augustine overcome the apparent contradiction? By using a method of interpretation called allegory. The teachings of the Old Testament, according to Augustine, could only be understood by taking the Old Testament as allegory. Augustine spiritualized the Old Testament, teaching that the histories of the Old Testament had nothing to do with God. In reality, that the stories about God in the Old Testament only taught about God in pictures like parables. So, the parting of the Red Sea was an allegory. Didn't really happen. Um, creation was an allegory. It wasn't literal. Um, you know, I, I mean, I can go on and on, you know. According to Augustine, the Old Testament was not a perfect revelation of God and his character. So the commandments of God are not a perfect revelation of God and his character? I mean, when you look at the Big Ten, I think that perfectly expounds upon his character. But contained bits and pieces about God that we had to figure out with allegorical interpretation. Augustine's influence was so great that for a thousand years his method of interpreting the Bible was the official method of interpretation used by the church. Here's what James J. O'Donnell wrote on his online article, Augustine the African. Here Christianity began to appear to him in a new, intellectually respectable light. You know, and that's so, you know, it's like, yes, you know, I mean, granted, you know, we have some of us out here in the um, historicist mindset that do have a sense of intellectual speaking. You know, w you know, sometimes the way we speak may sound intellectual to others, and so it might go over the head of some, but, um... A lot of this thought and a lot of this confusion is based, and especially the whole debate about Bible versions. A lot of people like to use intellectual authors and um, individuals to bring about their basis of which Bible they use. I want to state this that the writings of the New Testament, I can almost guarantee you, the originals, never came from high educated men. I bet you 10 to 1, they came from just as simple of people as you and I. And it's these intellectuals that decided to pervert it into something else. That's all I'm going to say on that. As before, his most pressing personal problem with his sense of evil and his responsibility for the wickedness of his life, with the help of technical vocabulary borrowed from Platonic philosophy, Ambrose proposed a convincing solution for Augustine's oldest dilemma. 
Augustine had, besides a specific objection to Christianity that only a professor of Bell's letters could have, he could not love the scriptures because their style was inelegant and barbaric. Here again, Ambrose, elegant and far from barbaric, showed Augustine how Christian exegesis could give life and meaning to the sacred texts. How did Augustine's philosophical background affect Christian doctrine? Well, his Neoplatonic views affected his view of God, which is passed on to the church at large. Augustine bought into the Platonic beliefs about the perfect ideal. Plato taught that everything that existed was merely a mirror of the one true thing that was perfection. And this perfect ideal was unchangeable. If it could change, it wouldn't be perfect. With that as his philosophical presupposition, Augustine brought in an unbiblical definition about God's immutability that survives as orthodoxy to this day. This is from chapter 2 of Bob Moore's online book, Calvinism, Ten Little Caveats. From Plato comes the concept of the forms, quote-unquote, or perfect ideals. This gave students of philosophy, one being Augustine, the notion that God does not change in any way because he is perfect. What is perfect, it is argued, does not change because by definition, perfect means a level beyond which nothing can exceed. Nothing is more perfect than flawless, A+, plus or 100%. For a Platonist, things which change are inferior to things which do not change. The Bible presents God as changeless, but the Christian tradition being shaped by Augustine and others had to interpret what that meant. They had to decide if it meant that God did not change in character or if it meant that he did not change in some stronger sense. Don't believe that our Christian Orthodox doctrine relies on Greek philosophy? Then read these quotes from The Providence of God by Benjamin Ritt Farley as cited in Bob Moore's book. The rudiments of a reformed doctrine of the providence of God lie deeply embedded in the Western philosophical tradition. There is little point in debating this. Wisdom and truth consist in acknowledging the fact and in showing how Christian and later Reformed doctrines differ significantly from the older, inherited, philosophical views. Farley reflects further. Has Reformed theology wed itself too closely to the classical world's concept of God's perfection, omnipotence, omniscience, and immutability in its attempts to witness to the God of Scriptures? To be certain... Such concepts have their place in guiding the church's reflection on the biblical God of providential activity. They enable the church to avoid the pitfalls of defining God in ways that make him subservient to other factors in the universe. They call the church's attention to glaring inconsistencies in its assertions about deity, but they need not control our understanding of God's interaction with his world. A third problem with Augustine that is not discussed often is his tendency to develop doctrine based on his experience rather than scripture. I have heard it said, quote, a man's philosophy is dictated by his morals. The same is true for his theology. Augustine wrote an autobiography considered to be a classic, which is called Confessions, and in it, he discusses his problems with sin. He spends a great deal of time dealing with an incident as a young teenager in which he stole pears from a neighbor's tree and uses this event to develop and teach the doctrine of original sin. Because Augustine had a problem with promiscuity and lust, and even as a churchman and bishop had problems with his thought life, he concluded that no one is able to choose to do good. 
his problem with the settings and formed his problem with the settings and formed the basis for the doctrine of the other depravity of man. This experiential theology, based on his own moral failures, caused him to attack the biblical theology of Pelagius and Celestius and Julian of Eclanum, who taught man's responsibility. This is what these three men taught. Who taught man's responsibility to choose to follow God. Now this is where this gets really interesting. A fourth problem area with Augustine is an area that, while well known among scholars, is not widely discussed, but is absolutely critical in evaluating the truth of the doctrines that he developed and foisted on the church. This last area deals with Augustine's method of dealing with those who disagreed with his teachings. Pay very close attention to this, folks, because this is of the utmost importance, and this is really the mindset of a lot of these fathers. Not just Augustine. I'm just using Augustine as an example because Augustine is like the tip top of the father spear. Okay? So... Let's go ahead and continue. Again, this last area is this, this fourth problem is of vital importance. Since Augustine's teachings became the touchstone for church doctrine, both Catholic and Protestant, it is vital that we examine the process by which Christian doctrine became settled and was handed down to us. Augustine was born in 354 in the time of a Christian Roman Empire. Pay attention, Augustine did not have to live through the time of persecution that had been on the church for 250 years. And so did not know the powerlessness that the meek followers of Christ had experienced. Instead, Augustine came into a church with politically well-connected bishops who had direct lines of communications to authorities on all levels including the Roman Emperor and Augustine as a bishop of his time used his resources well early in Augustine's Christian career a controversy arose over the views of Donatus. Do not be deceived by classical theologians into thinking that Donatus were heretics. They were not. Instead, Donatus were basically Christians who believed in holiness. Coming out of the time of the great persecution of Diocletian, Donatus and his followers refused to accept the leadership and ministry of priests and bishops who had shown cowardice that shown cowardice in the face of persecution. I think the same cowardice exists in the majority of the Christian church today. <sighs> but that's basically one of the main reasons why a lot of people would, you know, if they know who the Donatists are, would call them heretics because they did not go along with the status quo of what was going on with the church at large. They remain separate. The appointment of a minister who had handed over scriptures to be burned was a rallying cry of the Donatist. Let me repeat that. Okay, I, I mean, this, this is in the early centuries. We're not talking about the Reformation. This is like the 4th century. Okay? I mean... Let me read this again. The appointment of a minister who had handed over scriptures to be burned was a rallying cry of the Donatists. Hmm. 
As an opponent to the Donatists, Augustine was a vigorous fighter for the Catholic Church. And by the way, why would these why were these scriptures handed over and burned? Because those that remained separate had no right in interpreting the Bible and studying the Bible for themselves. And Augustine was a vigorous fighter for the Catholic Church. He weighed in with sermons and writings condemning them, the Donatists, which, given his perspectives as a Catholic, is understandable. After all, as Christians, we're called to contend for the faith. And if we believe that people are teaching false doctrines, heresies that endanger the faith of weaker Christians, we're to expose the error and preach the truth. However, Augustine took the fight one step further ignoring the lessons of the history of the early church and its experiences with bitter, angry men who sought to destroy it with persecution. Augustine advocated the persecution of the Donatists. Advocated it. I think this is another reason why the Reformation didn't go all the way. Because they didn't want to let go of the teachings of the church fathers. You need to kind of look at the history between mainline Protestants during the same time of the Reformation era and the Anabaptists and how they, how the Anabaptists were also persecuted by these same Protestants who were being persecuted by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was persecuting both Protestants and Baptists and Anabaptists and Waldenses. But the Protestants themselves were also persecuting Anabaptists. And also certain sects that were also called Sabbatarians as well. The Protestants do not have a pure history, folks. Sure, God used them in a mighty way to get the Bible into our hands, and that we can never take away from them. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that both Protestant and Catholics alike revere Augustine and a lot of these other... I'm not even going to say it. A lot of these church writers... At such a high standard for Christian doctrine. And Augustine was an advocate for persecution of those that did not go along with his theology. <clears throat> in Aurelius of Carthage and in Augustine, the Catholics at last had leaders who were a match for the Donatists. Augustine issued exhaustive historical and theological counter-arguments and a justification of coercion while Aurelius organizing ability produced effective action yet it took legal sanctions to check Donatism especially the Edict of Unity in 405 and the proscription which followed the convention in Carthage in 411 Eerdmann's Handbook to the History of Christianity is where that was taken from. So did you get that? Augustine wrote justifying the legal coercion of Christians who disagreed with him. Since when do we resort to legal courts and edicts to decide Christian practice? It is in the last battle of his life with the Pelagians that Augustine really distinguished himself as a man willing to use the methods of the world and not the Bible, to achieve his purposes. And how does the Catholic Church operate today? Don't they use the means of the state to achieve its purposes? Pelagius, by all accounts, including Augustine's... Pelagius, by all accounts, including Augustine's, a godly man was appalled at Augustine's teachings on original sin. 
and taught differently than Augustine, thus earning Augustine's enmity. He did not believe that all were tainted with the sin of Adam and opposed Augustine's teachings. Pelagius also merited the anger of another so-called father of the church, Augustine's compatriot, Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin. It seems that there was a monk whose name was Jovinian who taught that it was all right for priests to marry, that there was no great virtue in remaining celibate. Jerome, along with Augustine, on the other hand, was one of the leaders of the teaching that married saints were of a lesser class than celibate saints. Jerome was a vicious man, known for his disgusting attacks on opponents, and his characterizations of Jovinian was no different. Jerome depicting this saint as a bacchanalian orgiast. Pelagius took Jerome to task for such a rotten manner of arguing, thus earning the hatred of Jerome. So, you see where a lot of these doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church stem from? Do you see why now the Catholic Church considers Augustine the doctor of theology? Finally, Pelagius was a holiness preacher. Living in Rome, he condemned the loose morals of the emperor's court, thus earning the enmity of Emperor Honorius. As many did when it looked like the barbarians might overwhelm Rome, Pelagius left Rome for other parts, specifically Palestine. While living in Palestine, several of Augustine's followers in Palestine brought charges of heresy against Pelagius, and Jerome joined in the accusations. There were two trials, or synods, held in Palestine, and at both of these examinations, Pelagius was declared to be orthodox. He was pres present to defend himself and explain what he taught. Not content to have Palestinian bishops try Pelagius, Augustine had two more trials, or synods, held to examine Pelagius' teachings both in North Africa and Augustine's own hometown, no less. And to no one's great surprise, these two kangaroo courts declared Pelagius to be a heretic. Mind you, these two trials were held in North Africa, under Augustine's direction, and without Pelagius there to defend his teachings. Doesn't that sound vaguely familiar to those that were accused by the church? during the time of the Reformation, when a lot of them weren't even present at these trials or these synods, synods. The result of these four trials were sent to Pope Innocent of Rome, who sided with Augustine. But Innocent had been lobbied hard by Augustine ahead of time, and Pelagius had not had a chance to defend his teachings. Knowing that Augustine was working to have him declared heretical, Pelagius prepared a defense of his teachings and sent it to Rome. Now, here is this aspect. Now, you got to remember, I mean, because I believe this, is, this happened in the 5th century, okay? This mystery of iniquity was already at work, okay? But it did, it did not rise into prominence until the later part of the 6th century. And so that's why a lot of times these popes in the early times, even though you could still call them man of sin, even though they haven't been revealed as such, they were still the little horn. But the thing is, is that these high priestly individuals, these fathers, quote unquote, were still able to lobby these popes. in these types of things, okay? It hasn't been a total subjection as the Pope, as the Holy Father, and everything is underneath. You know, these men, such as Augustine, were still able to lobby hard, okay? And this was the case of Pelagius. 
and Pelagius had not had a chance to defend his teachings. Knowing that Augustine was working to have him declared heretical, Pelagius prepared a defense of his teachings and sent it to Rome. Now, here is the rub. Innocent died before Pelagius, Pelagius' defense arrived, and a new pope was selected, Zosimus. And Zosimus received Pelagius' written defense, and after reading the defense, reopened the case. After examining both sides, Zosimus declared Pelagius orthodox. This is not widely known. Pelagius was declared by an impartial bishop to be orthodox in this doctrine. Very strange. This gave Augustine and his party fits, and so they decided to enlist a little more help. Remember how Augustine supported using legal force to settle church matters in the matter of the Donatists? Because at the time, the state still had a higher ranking than the Church of Rome? Well, remember how Augustine supported using legal force to settle church matters in the matter of the Donatists? Augustine decided to enlist the emperor in this matter of doctrine. Augustine and his party decided to appeal to Emperor Honorius to join in on this matter of doctrine. In addition, a fellow bishop and friend of Augustine, Alepius, sent a bribe of 80 stallions to Honorius to use his influence on Sosimus. Again, to no one's surprise, the following year, Sosimus bowed to imperial pressures and declared Pelagius a heretic. The church, after the death of Augustine and Pelagius, and under the string of imperial pressure and Jerome's hatred, went on to declare all of Pelagius' teachings heretical and all of Augustine's as orthodox. There's your history. Now you know why Augustine's teachings are such revered, revered by both the Scarlet Harlot and her daughters. It is due to the ungodly efforts of Augustine and his party that we owe the spectacle of church doctrine being decided by political power and chicanery. The summary. Doing the research, we can see that Augustine, far from being a saint, was responsible for much bad theology being introduced into the church. Because of him, we have the teachings of Gnostics and pagans masquerading as Christian doctrines. Because of Augustine's appeal to force, we have a Christian history marred with the image of a blood-stained church willing to kill to enforce its positions. And so, there you have it. And again, you can just trace this all the way up into the future from this present time, from like the 5th century onwards. You have the Waldenses, who were totally separate and outside of this hierarchical structure of church buildings and cathedrals. They were completely out of that mindset, completely separate. And they still knew who the Antichrist was, and they still knew what Rome was all about, and they still had a purity about them. More of a purity than I would even have to say a lot of the Protestants and those of the Reformation. The same thing as the Anabaptists, early Anabaptists, and the early Baptists, the Sabbatarians. Because, truth be known, you know, again, there is no denying that the Reformation was used by God. And it was used by God in a mighty way. And that is to specifically identify the Antichrist and to get the Bible into the hands of the common man into the vulgar tongue.
But the thing is, when you look at everything else, the thing is with the Reformation and these Protestants, they didn't really necessarily want to leave the Catholic Church. They wanted to reform it. And it was through a lot of these teachings of the fathers that they based their ideas of reform from. These same fathers that the Catholic Church holds in a high standing. While those of the remnant who always remain separate who were always persecuted by both Protestant and Catholic still remained on the premise of the fact that Jesus and the Apostles and the Scriptures and the Scriptures only not Scriptures plus tradition because even the Protestants have this aspect of scripture plus tradition and you can get the tradition from these fathers these church fathers and history just totally throws the apostles of Christ way out of the picture when it comes to the fathers of the church even the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament they don't even recognize them but they'll recognize Jerome They'll recognize Augustine. Personally, I think that's a slap in the face of the Father, of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son. And so I commend a lot of the older Protestant views that decided to start veering away from the teachings of the Fathers. And embracing the concept of Sola Scriptura. So, those that are involved in Reformed Church congregations, um, this would be a very good point to bring out regarding Augustine. And is very questionable history. Because here you have a, a man, just like a lot of these others, who advocated for the persecutions of those that didn't go along with the status quo of what was now called Christian, which was not originally Christian from the beginning. So, that's going to be it for this video. I hope this is blessed you um and until next time truth be told truth be known stay safe god bless and we will see you next time bye bye